Hey everyone, welcome back to Observe. In today's video, we're going to be analyzing the nonverbal communication of Casey Anthony again. This is a multi-part series. If you haven't seen the other parts, I'd suggest going and checking those out. But today we'll be continuing from where we left off. More on that in just a second. Let's go ahead and roll the intro. Okay, since this is a multi-part series and this is not the first part, I'm not going to go through the entire backstory. If you would like to see those, I'd suggest going and checking out those other ones. With all of that being said, I think that now is as good a time as any to go ahead and just dive right into the footage. Can you talk to me about the process of deciding to tell your defense team about what happened with Kaylee? It's still not a conversation I've really had in depth with any of them to this day. And the desire was to never again open those boxes, to never have to relive those things that happened. So this is something that I just wanted to add in here. So what I've done is I've gone through this docu-series that was put out onto Peacock to be able to find all of the footage of Casey Anthony as, as they're speaking about the various things. So during this part, I do find it interesting that even just verbally speaking, Casey has still yet to divulge what she believes happens has happened to Kaylee. And this is something that stays constant throughout, which is in and of itself a fascinating behavior at very base level. So we're going to be working with that as part of the knowledge that she still has yet to actually give any information out. But let's let's see how there are various experts and things like that that are talking on and speaking on her behavior. And then we'll see what she's doing non-verbally as well. We'll get an idea as we're going along. Pat McKenna was part of my defense team. After everything was done with my case, after the trial, long after July of, of 2011, my defense team, they truly became my family. And we've chosen to still stay banded because we truly do look at one another as, as not just colleagues and war buddies, but as, as family and, and friends. And I love these people so much. Liz, Pat, Dorothy, Cheney. So we are on our way now to Liz's house. Okay, so I'll go ahead and pause that there. So during that time, what I was be being able to notice, there wasn't anything that was indicating some desynchronization or any signs of deception, really. But what I will note is that during the time that she's talking about how there was a fan, like they're looking at each other as a family and all of this, she does have some micro shakes no in there, which might be related and likely is related to the you wouldn't believe. Along with that, she does have a little bit of scorn and disgust creeping in there as well at that same time. Now, why that might be in there is rather difficult to decipher just from this perspective. Likelihood is it would be centered around the fact that many people might challenge that or find that as not true or find that as likely only part of the story, which is genuinely likely the case. However, during that time, even with some mouth shrugs that we saw and, and these very small facial tics, I would not say that anything that they said or presented in this area was deceitful or even questioning its authenticity. I do believe that they probably developed a semi-familial bond during their time around each other as one might have to in a case like this. Let's continue forward. It just gives me so much peace seeing them. Hi! <laughs> Hi, honey, how are you? Thank <laughs> you, sweetheart. Hi! Hi! <laughs> oh, I've been crying all day. I'm going to go ahead and pause here for the filmmaking side of things. This no doubt took several shots to do. They definitely went up and knocked on the door and said, hey, we're going to be doing this shot. I need you to go in. I need you to have an emotional display. So all of this is going to be very, very forced, very fake in general. So we're able to kind of get an idea as to how Casey might behave while acting. And she's able to pull out these tears. Now, perhaps the tears are coming in genuinely wild going through this forced fake definitely set up kind of introduction here but it does let us know that she does have that ability to at least get those tears going 
perhaps at a not so genuine point. So that means that in the future we'll be keeping an extra close eye out for these times that she's crying or displaying those tears to see if that is a genuine emotion. Does it have the genuine onset? Does it have the genuine fall off? Is it a genuine emotion or is it something that she has been coached and or practiced and trained into doing? Not too much to be able to say that quite here, but it is something to definitely make note of. Oh my God. Oh, I'm tired. Also, I wanted to make a note of the pauses and awkward spaces in between the conversation between the two different people during this time. That again is letting us know that this is all pretty forced. It's all pretty rehearsed and fake. So normal conversations will flow back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This, how are you doing? Sits down. Oh, I'm tired. Really long pause. Reach out. Touch. It, it, it just does not flow naturally, which it likely wouldn't largely because of the fact that they may have even had to do this a few shots, few takes, something along those lines. So that's making sense non-verbally to see that in there. It is letting us know that that's likely a little bit fake, but let's continue watching throughout this. I laughed to Jose Baez out of the room that we were meeting in, telling him there was no fucking way. Casey would have nothing to do with it. I would rather have been found guilty and spent my life, the rest of my life on death row, fighting for my life and my innocence than to have ever pled to something I didn't do. I That's an interesting statement. I would rather have been found guilty and fighting for the rest of my life than have pleaded to something I didn't do. So this is in relation to them trying to talk Casey into taking a plea deal because of just the odd situation that everything has been found in. And so she's very brazenly saying that she didn't even consider it. It wasn't even a, an option for her. And that's a fascinating thing to be able to make note of just decision wise that she would rather spend her entire life in jail on death row, row rather than actually going through a, a plea deal, which it would have been about 20 years is what she was looking at. So that mm, that could actually push towards authenticity there, that that decision, that holding to I'm completely innocent. However, if we want to be able to also play devil's advocate on that side of things, Ted Bundy did the same thing. He absolutely pled fully innocent all the way through, all the way up until the very end. And so it's not necessarily that since she's saying, no, I, dude, I'll stick to it. I'm sticking to my guns here. That is not indicating genuinely that she's being fully authentic. It's just a possible indicator thereof. So considering everything else in context would be very important in this area. And that's why you have to be able to take a lot of these analyses style things into context with everything else because if you just take a small little segment like this then you're likely to miss a lot of the contextual clues that could be in there as well let's continue watching i lied to the cops i wrote those checks i admitted guilt on each of those that was it hmm. that's an interesting thing there again again we're hearing casey anthony admit that she has lied multiple times on multiple different things and then she turns around and she's hoping to ask everybody to be like, but now, now I'm not lying. I've lied and I've lied and I've lied. I'll admit to lying. I have done a lot of lying. But right now, now when it's really more convenient for me to not be lying, I'm going to try to convince you that I'm, I'm not lying. And that doesn't stick to their behavioral pattern before. However, for the sake of being able to look at it without as much bias from knowing everything else, during that time, their nonverbal communication was also rather desynchronized. You could tell that it was a little bit broadened out. And there are some forced motions in there as well as they're trying to line up some of their hand gestures with their head gestures and their facial expressions. And it feels lightly desynchronized all the way throughout that. Long story short, during that area, I would not necessarily believe that they're being fully authentic there. It would be something that I would be like, yeah, okay, um, we'll, we'll have to circle back around in a different way, try to circumvent this guard that she's put up about how now she's all just so 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 honest and it's not necessarily easily bought and there's a reason for that let's continue it was never consideration ever i will never forget what happened inside of those courtrooms i will never forget the anxiety and the dread going to walk through those doors to get off of those elevators. I'm going to go ahead and pause that. That was synchronized throughout there. I will never constant no shaking in there. The drawing of the eyebrows together and lowered like that. That's a sign of aggression. It could be 
in relation to the experience itself. It could be in relation to experiencing the emotions coming back around. Regardless, that area was synchronized. And even regardless of guilt or, or not guilt, she was still likely feeling a level of anxiety and stress centered around that time. Notice she didn't mention anything about grief or sadness in there, and this is kind of giving us a picture of the fact that Casey is very self-centered on this entire, entire display. But we are seeing at least synchronized indications that she was indeed anxious and stressed while in the courtroom. It just doesn't necessarily clear her on any level. So let's continue. Good afternoon, members of the jury. Mr. Baez, you may proceed. Come with me to 4937 Hope Spring Drive. It looks like the all-American home. In fact, you can drive by any home in the United States and never know what goes on behind closed doors. You never know what secrets lie within. I'm going to go ahead and pause. So when it flashes to Casey watching this footage of herself, we'll talk about both different ones. So in the flash of Casey watching herself, we're able to see a fair bit of action up here in the glabella in the forehead area as that would be an indicator of stress, anxiety, perhaps sadness could be in there. It's a very easy emotion to fake. Anybody can kind of move their eyebrows around to look like that. And then there's a pretty well-timed sigh of, of perhaps exasperation or just trying to maintain emotional state. And that feels a little bit forced to me to have that show up there. Perhaps it was an editing choice. Maybe that was from a different time that they plop it in. That's something that we also have to keep in mind is that this is all seen also through the lens of the editor. But then once we're up on the screen here, we are seeing what I would I would consider genuine and emotional displays as she's trying to wipe away tears, not making a lot of eye contact. You're seeing a stiff upper lip. All of these things are pretty common in genuine emotion. And at least at that time, she was not really well versed on acting. She might be in this docu-series, but at that point, she was not a great actress at the time. So we'll be able to keep an eye on that to see if, if there's anything that pops up from both of these two different clips here. You see, this family must keep its secrets quiet. And it all began when Casey was eight years old and her father came into her room and began to touch her inappropriately. And it escalated. And it escalated. Did you know what he was going to say? No. Did you know he was going to bring up the abuse? No. You didn't know? Didn't tell me. He okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pause that here. So during the time that he brings up this abuse, so if we're taking Casey Anthony at her word here, that she did not know that was coming in here, so we would expect to see an emotional reaction, which I believe she talks about here in a moment. But that emotional reaction, I did not catch anything of shock or surprise. I did, however, catch a fair bit of shame or perhaps guilt in that vein of emotional display as she's looking down consistently, not looking up, not making eye contact with anybody around very, very shameful expression on her face mixed in with the tears and the wiping away thereof and so to be able to hear that perhaps she was not privy to knowing that this was going to be brought up in the trial that could make sense it's fascinating to me that there was no sense of surprise in there but in relation to the actual incident itself and what its its subject matter is it would also make sense that she might not want to emotionally display too much during that time, especially if she's been trying to keep it rather hidden and rather secret. So let's hear what her explanation is. He did not even come to see me before we went into court. He didn't tell me anything. He wanted to make sure my reaction and my response was as real and raw as possible. So he didn't want me to be prepped for this. Okay, so during this time, this is all centered around aggression. Her number of communication, her tone, everything is centered around aggression. And this could make sense considering how sensitive the subject matter is. If this was something that she was surprised by, then it would be something that you might have an angry or aggressive response to being surprised by it. So in that, that could make sense. And very, very fluid, genuine emotional displays as she's talking about it. Her hands are lining up with her words and her face is lining up with her hands. Everything is quite synchronized all the way across. So in that, I would be pushed to believe that she's being rather authentic with 
saying that she did not expect or know that this was going to be brought up at the trial at that time. I, under I also understand why it might be done that way to be able to invoke as genuine of a response as possible. Now, the response that we're seeing is still rather subdued. It is centered around shame. We're seeing a fair bit of that, but nothing outside of that. And it hasn't really broken the pattern from before, but there was a slight uptick in these self-soothing gestures and behaviors as she's wiping away tears and looking away shame, so on and so forth. So that does, it does make sense in context, but I'm not, I'm not finding anything in this area to help us understand whether or not she's being authentic or disingenuine on any level. So we'll just keep watching. What I'm feeling in that moment, listening to Jose Baez tell the world about the abuse that I suffered was absolute shame. I remember that feeling like it was yesterday. Okay, so during this area, a lot of chin tucking comes in here. So before, her head was held a little bit more high, and now she's starting to tuck, tuck her chin more and more. Now, this is a defensive gesture. As somebody starts to tuck their chin, it protects this area of your neck, which is full of a lot of vital arteries and veins and etc. So it's a very important area of your body. So when you see that chin tucking coming in, that lets you know it's um, on a level defensive. And then what I find uh, interesting is when she says that it's absolute shame, she has a pretty substantial eye blocking and eye roll in there centered around absolute shame. Not sure why that would be in there. That dismissal and that blocking doesn't quite make sense to me as far as to what emotional display might be going along with that. It could be in relation to the actual instance itself. Many people feel that that dismissal or shame or uh, blocking centered around those those sorts of instances. So that could be it. It is definitely something that I made note of in there. And it's also absolute shame. There's a big, big no shake in there. With that being no shake, that lets us know it's not necessarily a slip up. The smaller the, the movement, the more likely it is to be a, a seepage of nonverbal communication. When it's a massive movement like that, it's more easily controlled. So absolute shame, that likely means that you wouldn't believe, but it was absolute shame. And then our question then is, is like, okay, so what, what would be the reason that it would be semi-unbelievable there? There's a lot of questions around this, but it's still nothing to be able to point us towards authentic or deceitful. Let's continue. There's always going to be that part of me that's going to feel like I'm not enough because of what happened. I'm not good enough because of all of the things that have happened to me. Not good enough for what? just not good enough, that I'm tarnished, tainted. That's a really, really, really hard moment. I'm going to go ahead and pause here to make a note about what they're displaying non-verbally. We're seeing some of these things where she's saying tarnished and tainted. We're seeing some disgust, perhaps contempt slipped in there. And that does make sense. That would be lining up even just speaking about how they're speaking and the the situation that they're speaking of. So that does make sense. What I find fascinating, there's a there, there's some complexities to this, is that we're entering into another area where perhaps Casey Anthony might find a way to see or present herself as more of a victim in an area, which could genuinely be the case. And that's where this is complex is because She's now relying on this area that is, I, I am a victim in this area. I'm going to lean into the emotional state here. You can hear the emotion coming into her voice as her vocal cords are tightening and she's trying to fight back some tears and we're seeing some of the moisture on her eyes and whatnot. So that could be in there. It is fascinating that, again, this is only in an area that's centered around herself rather than anything that was with Kaylee. Once again, anytime that we have seen an emotional display that looks to be very genuine from Casey, it's centered around how... Things have been hard for her and almost never centered around her daughter that was missing and and then found dead. Like it, it, It's just a fascinating thing that the only time we're seeing this grief is centered around Casey almost talking about how hard things were for, for Casey. But let's continue watching. It was the deepest, darkest secrets that she held laid out bare in front of the public. Her chin started to shiver. I could see the tears coming, and it was the first time I saw that whatever defense mechanisms she had built over the years were not gonna be working for her anymore. 
and the jury understood the relevant. I'm going to go ahead and pause there because they're talking a little bit about nonverbal communication and the, the lady's talking about what would be considered an normal emotional profile as it kind of builds in and you see it develop and come to fruition as emotions do rather than just crash into a sudden emotion, a, a sudden emotional display. So hearing that the, the chin was starting to quiver and then the eyes and so on and so forth, that is an emotional profile. So hearing that, that likely would push us to believe that at least at that time, Casey was feeling a genuine emotion. Once again, this is kind of centered around their own victimhood rather than anything to do with their daughter. But it is something to make note of that at least people were paying attention to the body language that she was displaying during this time. Now, whether or not that means that she was being authentic throughout the trial, that's, that's, not, that's not supported here. But it does at least mean that at some points, there were people that were noticing that she had some emotional displays that were genuine. Let's continue watching. The relevance of the innocent until proven guilty standards and that Kaylee's death was shocking. Casey was, was stunned. Young people who are not trained on how to deal with trauma simply shut down and pretend it didn't occur. If someone can't deal with a trauma like that because they are so close to their child and they love their child so very much, that says that they are a good mother, not a bad mother. That's a bold statement to make to where it, it generalizes everybody. And uh, obviously that's not the case. There are many people that have gone through similar circumstances, perhaps losing a child, something along those lines. And that's not how they necessarily react. Just because you're young and something traumatizing happens does not mean that you're going to shut down or go in pendulum and have this rather outgoing, drastic personality during that time. Now, it definitely can be true. There is an element that is true to that, that people will have difficulty processing the negative emotions. So when they do enact or react to the world around them, it looks as if they're not at all relating to the emotion that sh should normally or what we would normally consider normal should normally be displayed. So with that, that's fair, but the overgeneralization of that by this person here makes it to where it feels rather more so like she's trying to build up this everybody is this way, nobody has any exceptions here, so if this is the way that it is for one, two, three people, then that's the case for all the other 97 people or anything like that. And, and that's just a bit of a red flag to me. Many of you even probably watching this have had substantial amounts of trauma and your response was maybe not to do as Casey did. And so that that in and of itself disqualifies that statement entirely. And so let's continue watching. Other. When Crystal Holloway took the stand and, and told her story, it was really clear that she was doing her level best to tell her truth, even though it was so far outside of anything she was actually comfortable with. Without Crystal Holloway coming in, I'm not sure where we would have ultimately landed. I'm going to go ahead and pause that. So Crystal came in and added some extra testimony to this. And what I find fascinating, even verbally, the word choice is being used here is that it's her truth. It's not saying the factual truth. It's not saying the evidentiary truth. It's her truth, which then kind of puts it to where it's based off of another person's perception of things and another person's word. So I was not able to track down the actual footage of her testimony to be able to work with. Perhaps that's something that is is somewhere out and available to be able to look at. I was not able to find it. If you find it and you would like me to react to it, let me know somehow, some way. I have an email and things like that, so that would be the best way to do it. But I do want to make note that even now, the defense team is admitting that their results, their, their verdict was perhaps only found because of somebody's specific truth. And if that had not existed, then that might not go that way. And that's not necessarily what I would say concrete evidence of innocence, but we're still functioning off of this innocent until proven guilty side of things. Now, there seems to be more and more and more evidence being piled up against Casey in this case, but it was silly. we have instances like this where we're, we're left questioning the validity of things. Let's continue. Casey has never told me what happened with Kaylee, but I think the evidence in this and the science support that it was most likely an accidental drowning 
that really did snowball out of control where no one acted like you're supposed to act when an accident happened. Admittance of partial guilt. So the evidence most likely said that there was the possibility that it was a partial accidental drowning and it snowballed and it went out of control and nobody behaved the way they were supposed to and blah 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 a lot of excuses in there and none of what they deliver is at all certain either so with the best case of the best we still don't know from the defense's side what happened to kaylee only a lot of assumptions for it and they kind of vaguely state the science and the evidence really push us to maybe believe that dot 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 so that's not necessarily very certain at all. And then non-verbally speaking, what we're seeing is a lot of dismissive non-verbal communication as she's doing a number of eye rolls and looking away. And you're getting the idea very, very clearly that this has been something that has been brought up again and again and again. And by the response, it sounds as if the response to it has been the same again and again and again of like, yeah, everybody kind of messed up on this one, which just doesn't feel like it's cutting it for many people. And it's it's interesting that it's being able to cut it for the defense team of the person who is being tried for murdering murdering her daughter. Um, it seems like there would want to be a lot more concrete, solid proof centered around the innocence side of things, but we're not seeing it here. And non-verbally speaking, we're not seeing it backed up either. So let's keep watching. When an accident happens, you know, the defense made the argument that uh, that she drowned in the pool, which is interesting because we gave her that as an option. Right now, your best bet is to just get it out in the open. There's nothing you're going to tell any of the three of us that's going to surprise us, okay? Mm -hmm. I've had to sit down with mothers whose kids have drowned in swimming pools. And she was adamant that that didn't occur. So now we're having another issue within the defense, even in this docuseries here that Casey is saying, no, this is not at all what happened. Won't say what happened, but th it wasn't that. And then we're saying the defense is saying, oh, no, that's probably what that might have been what happened. If you kind of look at the evidence and whatnot, then perhaps. And we're hearing here that that spiel that we were hearing there is a recording from back at another interrogation where they were offering these possibilities to Casey. And so Casey was offered this way out of maybe it was an accident and Casey immediately said no it's just not it's not an accident it can't be it won't be and the defense is saying no it could be and they're supposed to be on the same team so that seems to be a little discrepancy in and of their own communication side of things let's see how Casey handles this in the docuseries look I'm not a psychologist but you're going to tell me that that what really happened was after my child drowned in the pool I stuck her in a laundry bag and dumped her in the woods and spent the next month partying. Which is a fascinating point that behaviorally speaking, this is where a lot of people are like, I just, it just does not make sense. And the response of, well, people sometimes react strangely to trauma is true, but it doesn't necessarily clear everything because even, even the, the expert that spoke earlier said that people will shut down. They won't react to it. And that's not all that Casey did. Casey maybe shut down, but she went further beyond that and escalated other behaviors as well, making even a decision so far as to get tattoos and things like that that are more permanent and partying, drinking, being caught in these different situations. Now, the behavior itself isn't abnormal. It's just fine for people of that age to behave that way. What was interesting is contextually it was a red flag. That's just an odd time to do that and an odd series of events that would lead up to it. So with the defense's proposed idea, this absurd concept of putting the child into a laundry bag and then dumping it and doing said things, it it's very, very unlikely. But uh, the, technically speaking, it's still possible. Please continue watching. There are too many scenarios of what could have happened, but her drowning in the pool is not one. A possible. In most scenarios, it would be plausible. Not in this one. The ladder wasn't on the pool. It's the only way in or out for her or for me. So why let Jose Bias and your defense team make that argument again and again? My mom was the first one that floated the theory that she could have drowned in the pool, and he went with what my mom said. He had to explain something. Okay, so now we're hearing it. Uh, Casey is saying that, that it wasn't up to me. It was 
blame shifting over to the mom. But that also being said, it doesn't sound as if Casey tried to stop that from happening. And the only excuse that she offered was that the ladder wasn't on the pool, which would that true. Maybe that's the only way possible for that child to be able to figure out a way to get into the pool. Could possibly be. Not necessarily so. But then also nonverbally speaking, we're seeing a lot more of this dismissive nonverbal communication with a lot of the eye rolls. We're seeing a lot of manipulation around the mouth and some lip compressions along those lines. And None of these are pushing me to believe in authenticity in this area. It feels as if maybe there's something centered around this that we're not able to be privy to that I would like to be able to dig more at, but we're not able to. So let's watch the rest of this and then we'll kind of summarize what we were able to learn during this little episode. Can't just tell the jury she doesn't know. So what was your thought on why she was wet? Something I still can't piece together. I wasn't the only one home. I'm not outright accusing him of murder, but it wasn't an accident in the pool. Okay, so there's the kicker, is that now we're bringing in this idea that it was all centered around him being the dad doing something to the granddaughter. And this is a new development. This wasn't something that was brought up in the original case, which is another area where people are like, well, why... Why wasn't it brought up in the original case? If you were so certain on this, why wasn't that brought forward almost almost immediately? I think that's a pretty fair and valid question for people to have. One that I am still not finding a suitable answer from Casey's defense team on. They're, so far, they've just been a disjointed mess trying to cover this up. And all that Casey's providing is that I don't know anything, but I know it wasn't this. And the way that they know it wasn't this was because a ladder wasn't there. It's mm, nothing is at all concrete on this, which that is discouraging to see. It makes it difficult to be able to find any sort of clarity in there. And it's not really putting everybody's concerns to rest uh, uh, on any level. There are a lot of people that are still very, very much not buying Casey's side of this. And so what I'm seeing is that there are areas that are authentic that she's displaying authentic shame during certain recollections that she's displaying, certain aggression that would line up and be synchronized with these areas that she's speaking of. There are also areas that are desynchronized, that feel fake, that feel forced and feel like they've been put on for a show, either one, for the sake of the docu-series, or two, for the sake of just trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. So this is all something that's just very fascinating to make note of. And it, I feel like it would be best for us to be able to continue on through the series to be able to round that out. But you'll have to let me know in the comments if that's something that you would like to do. I know that this is uh, quite quite a few parts on the Casey Anthony case. I am happy to continue down this if you would like to. Otherwise, I can keep moving on. Speaking of that, if you would like to be able to see me do a video centered around a, another true crime thing or a, centered around a mystery, anywhere where I could read some nonverbal communication would be pretty cool. Let me know in the comments below. You can also do so by messaging the socials. Either myself or somebody from the team will be able to reach out back to you. Uh, email is a, a way to be able to do that, especially if you have some business propositions and things like that. There are some cool changes coming up to the channel here. I'll be getting in and out of the studio a little bit more, hopefully being able to interact with more of you. That would be really fun. But they're all in development here as things are progressing forward. So. If you would like to be able to see these things, stay tuned. Hit the like button if you liked this video. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, oh yeah, ding the bell. I don't even know if the bell does anything anymore these days. So ding it if you like, if you can be one of the first people here to watch the video and I'd appreciate that. But, but without further ado, that's all that I've got for the day. My name is Logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers guys.